hi everyone. My name is Iber. I'm the founder of Urban AI, and it's a great pleasure of welcoming you today for this online symposium on generative AI. A uh, few days ago, we uh, actually published a report on uh, generative AI, uh, for which we interviewed several uh, worldwide experts. The goal of this report was to better understand uh, the world, the impact of generative AI on urban governance. And following uh, this report, we are doing this online symposium, this open discussion to propose you to better explore uh, this report with uh, uh, some of the experts uh, we interviewed for uh, this project and the lead author um, of this uh, report. Uh, so to, for, to this online symposium, we have the great pleasure of welcoming uh, Shazad Jameson, uh, who is the uh, Urban AI Senior Consultant at Techno uh, Technopolis. Uh, Santiago Garces, who is the Chief Information Officer at the City of Boston, Damiano Cerone, who is the co-founder at Urbanist AI, Emily Royal, who is the Smart City Coordinator at the City of San Antonio, and Ruth Nelson, who is the lead author of this report and PhD student at TU Delft. The program of this uh, inline symposium, first we will have an introduction by Ruth Nelson that will present some of the insights of this report. Then we will have uh, an open discussion with a panel that will share individual insights and reflections based on their own expertise, background and vision. And finally, we will have a Q&A session, open Q&A session with all of you. In the meantime, uh, feel free to use the chat if you want to share comments, questions, reflections, and we will ask them uh, for the Q&A session. Ruth, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Bear. Let me just share my screen so I can share the presentation. Um, just put this on and I'm gonna just make that smaller. <laughs> and go to the slideshow. Uh, can you see the slideshow, everyone? Um, yeah, I'm going to take that yep. as a yes. Okay. So uh, thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, I'm going to briefly just introduce the report to you that we wrote uh, called Generative AI for Urban Governance. So just to uh, introduce the team briefly. Of course, it was myself. Um, I am a spatial data scientist and PhD researcher at TU Delft. Obey Barash, who is the founder of Urban AI, and Kanmin Nang, who is an intern at Urban AI and is doing his Bachelor in Smart City Technology and Public Policy. So obviously, at the end of 2022, um, with the release of ChatGPT um, and MidJourney, this been a sort of proliferation of debates centered on generative AI, particularly in relation to the opportunities it will provide, for example, in relation to productivity, as well as potential risks, uh, security risks, biased outcomes. But what we found um, is that less attention has been focused on the impact that this technology might have for urban governance compared to other industries. This might be due to the fact the governments are usually slower to adopt uh, technology. They have um, budget constraints. And so really, we're only just beginning to understand generative AI in, in general, its capabilities and risks, as well as its application within urban governance. So in, in terms of the report, uh, the primary sort of research questions which we posed and asked were, how can generative AI be used by municipalities and what role does governance play in its application? What skills and processes and workflows are required? And what are the main challenges and risks in the application of generative AI to cities? With the overarching goal being to produce this report, this document for use, which could be used by municipalities, basically for uh, decision-making. So in terms of the methodology, what we did was a brief sort of literature review to kind of get an understanding of what research has been done in the field so far. We conducted a series of interviews with um, an expert panel. We did a thematic analysis um, on, on the interviews, um, which led to a set of actionable insights and recommendations. And really in this brief presentation, I'm just gonna be focusing on these three within the pa panel discussion, we'll be focusing on the actionable insights. 
So <laughs> I think it's important to just introduce AI in general. Um, AI has been around for a while and was first really defined. Uh, one of the first definitions was by John McCarthy in 1959. Um, it was defined as the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. A more recent definition by Russell and Norvig in 2010 was designing and building of intelligent agents that receive precepts from the environment and take actions that affect that environment. And even more recently um, is this definition, AI are not merely agents, but systems that display intelligent behavior by analyzing the environment, taking actions, and to a certain extent, autonomously achieving specific goals. And I think it's really uh, in relation to this Auton uh, this autonomous nature potential of AI that there has been a lot of, of debate whether or not it will replace humans, it will simply um, you know, be a supplement uh, to our existing kind of workflows and processes. And uh, I think this is, this is quite an interesting um, topic and area of debate. So in terms of AI, there's quite an ecosystem, many different kinds of AI and models exist. But one of the key kind of things which link the different models is that all AI has data on which it is trained. And what differentiates, differentiates generative AI is that it uses deep learning models to essentially generate new content that resembles the existing data sets. And we identified two sort of predominant architectures which exist, which are gener generative adversarial networks, SCANs, and generative pre-trained transformers. Um, and I mean, the, the GBT, ChatGPT, for example, is based on generative pre-trained transformer model, um, which I'm sure you, you're aware of. Um, and of course, both these models are used for generating new forms of data, but they have different architectures, parameters, and employ different algorithms. Uh, GPT models are based on the transformer architecture, which is well suited for processing sequential data, such as text and code. So it's very good at like predicting, for example, what would be the next word in a sentence. Whereas GANs models undergo the adversarial training process, which continuously trains itself to enhance and maximize the resemblance of the output data in comparison to the training data. So it has a discriminator and a generator. The generator kind of produces new data. The, discrim the discriminator tries to distinguish whether or not this new data is realistic. Um, and then within our literature review, we identified uh, three main areas where GANs have been applied uh, in, in to cities. And that is uh, sort of the image, image generated GANs, which basically are used to produce different images such as land use design generation, master plan generation, extraction and transformation of data from satellite images, even 3D sort of like impressions of the urban environment. The next one are graph generated GANs. So you can, as you can imagine, there are many different kind of networks and graphs within cities, such as, for example, the road network. So this type of GAN might be used to kind of generate new road networks within cities. And then there's data generated GANs. So there are lots of different data, different data sets within cities, of course, text, traffic flow data, GPS mobility data. And, and these kind of GANs can be used to generate, uh, yeah, generate these different kinds of data. For example, um, to kind of forecast what different traffic flow patterns might be in cities. Um, yeah. So in terms of generative AI and urban governance, we actually found a lot less literature <laughs> on this particularly. Um, but what we did realize is that cities all over the world are beginning to harness the power of data analytics and high level government re legislation is being developed in relation to the application of AI, right? Cities all over the world are collecting lots of data, they're processing data. Um, I mean, there's been the development of course of smart cities, digital twins. So really within this kind of ecosystem and these recent developments, there is the potential that generative AI could be utilized uh, in the management of cities, but really there's limited knowledge on the interface between local municipalities and AI, particularly generative AI. And of course, this is what this report, this is the gap that this report um, as a starting point uh, focused on. 
So the report would not have been possible without the experts who we interviewed. And it was very important for us to get experts from academia, industry, as well as government. So thank you to all the interviewees. Um, and just to reflect on the thematic analysis, after we'd done the interviews, we did a thematic analysis of each of the transfer scripts, identifying various themes which emerged, trying to link and connect them. And this essentially led to our set of sort of actionable insights, which were divided into four sections, applying generative AI and city governance, the role of municipalities in developing generative AI, skills and workflows and challenges and the future of generative AI. So yeah, that's the end of my little introduction. <laughs> and now we're going to move on to the panel. Great, so um, yeah, let's let's move on. So I'm going to begin with asking uh, sort of inter individual questions to uh, the different experts who we welcome here today. And um, we are going to begin with Damiano Cirone. Um, so thank you so much, Damiano. Um, <laughs> and the question that I am going to start with is, in section one of the findings in the report, one of our insights focuses on the potential application of generative AI for urban planning and design. As a practitioner, how can generative AI be used in participatory planning? What are the advantages in terms of facilitating interaction between different stakeholders? And can you provide us with any practical examples? Oh, well, yes, thank you. And thank you for having me here. Uh, I think I will share my screen uh, to sort of answer the question. Uh, uh, so yes, basically the what we have been observing in the past year uh, is that the generative AI in participatory planning, especially for municipalities, it's all about joyfully negotiating urban change. So it's not just a tool for social imagination, but it's a way to uh, to basically co-design the future of our city with joy. Um, and the other point I would say for municipalities especially is to have the agency to shift the stakeholders' role from commentators to placemakers. So right now we kind of ask questions, we kind of survey citizens, but we need to change that role to let them actually become placemakers of their own cities. So the classic journey is basically for, for local government, also national government actually, is to go from a capacity building moment where you can assimilate how the technology work to start to piloting it. And then after the pilot, usually you want to try to integrate new technology into the kind of actual process of planning. So this has been the sort of the journey that we have been also uh, working on with some of our partners, and it seems to be the one that is successful. Um, for instance, we've been working uh, also with mayors from, from all over the world, uh, but especially here is an example from the, from the mayors for uh, for economic growth, where basically, now it's a bit low resolution for some reasons, but where basically sort of we kind of uh, cities and, and municipalities train uh, train their staff to to become able to use uh, the generative AI, understand how it works. Um, a bit broader scope uh, with the United Nations Development Program. Uh, this is an example about making design guidelines for the new capital city of Indonesia. So again, what it happens is that the the local government uh, and NGOs uh, they assimilate uh, the knowledge and then through capacity building sessions. Uh, and then they use this technology in their projects as well. Here you can see also the mayor of Pristina uh, utilizing also uh, such a methods and technologies to uh, work together with the citizens to redesign uh, sort of a block of their city. So there's many opportunities actually for, I would say for local government. Uh, well, we started to work uh, on this technology in 2018. Uh, and it took well over four years indeed to, to get the municipalities on board to understand what the technology really does uh, and eventually even build and rebuild a few places. This is one in Helsinki. Uh, Helsinki has adopted this, uh, these methods and these technologies to co-design, uh, for example, here a street and a square in the city of Helsinki. Uh, so we can see that how changing the role can really happen, how uh, citizens can actually help to co-design the future of their public space. Um, and this is the example from the square I mentioned. Uh, 
but I would just conclude with the next step that I would say uh, that is basically, um, as you mentioned also, like one of the main issues is the biases in the model. So the next step for municipalities as well as for uh, big institutions is to start to train their own models. Uh, and this is, for example, what we're doing with Dubai, who is basically poised to become the first city to have their own locally trained generative AI model. So we're basically outsourcing uh, photographs from the city, from the citizens, from different institutions, so that we could have a locally trained model. So I would say this is sort of the next step then for cities once they, uh, they've integrated this into the practice. So this is pretty much uh, what I wanted to say, I think how I wanted to answer your question. Uh, and most of all, I would say that uh, for me, what is really important is also that local government to take this, uh, this moment to actually strengthen and support human networks. So having a participatory planning session with generative AI is not only about playing with tech, it's allowing people to generate their own networks during these sessions and during these events. So this is, I think, also really, really important to say. Amazing. Thank you so much for those insights. Um, oh, <laughs> Since we have a little bit more time uh, on uh, on the question, I just wanted to ask how how do you think the citizens have responded? Do you think they have you had any feedback? I mean, you must have. Have they felt empowered? You know, being able to use these tools to kind of envision some of their ideas. Um, uh, they did, but only on the only when the actual technology has been assimilated. So we noticed that you kind of, a cities really need to sort of add new roles. That's kind of the issue is that, okay, we have a new technology, we have a new way of doing participation, but the main question is how do we do it here uh, and who is in charge for it? So I would say the cities that have done that, they were sort of the happiest with doing it, but also the one that were successful, like in Helsinki that they managed to go exactly from a workshop to constructing kind of a road and a square within five months uh, and so I think that uh, this is kind of the feedback for me, at least that the ones that have just taken it as a kind of a one-off workshop or as a kind of one-off event, mm. uh, it kind of ended there. But cities that have truly understood or truly experimented how we should integrate this and who is in charge, they are the cities that keep on using it and also have seen the, I think I've seen the best results so far. Are they also the cities that kind of generally are better at doing participatory processes and they have that? already kind of set into the way that they do things. And they're now kind of using this as a tool to kind of enhance the existing sort of processes, which uh, yeah, exists within their workflows. In our experiences, which is in about, at least in this year, we had about 25 different corporations with 25 different kind of uh, institutions and cities and governments. I'm actually seeing, uh, this is a good question. I never thought, really thought about it, but like what, I seem, what it seems to be for me is that it's not so much about the cities that have a participatory planning process in place, but it's the cities and government institutions that have a innovation uh, strategy put in place. Because indeed, uh, that's what makes the difference between understanding, adopting and deploying a new technology against just kind of having a workshop. So I would say that, uh, yeah, the, the main factor has been the capacity of a city uh, to have a sort of a uh, yeah, governance innovation strategy that supported this. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your insights. We'll now move on to Shazad. <laughs> um, Shazad, so my question to you is, uh, in section two of the report, we reflect on the role of municipalities in the application of generative AI. One of our insights was linked to facilitating relationships with both public and with both the public and the private uh, sector. How can municipalities foster an environment for collaboration, innovation with both the public and private companies? And in addition, how can municipalities responsibly use technology adopted from the private sector? If you have any examples, that would also be great. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Um, so thank you very much for having me, first of all. Um, urban AI always feels like a very welcoming space for discussion, which I really appreciate. Um, 
And which also, I think, uh, I felt I had a little leeway in answering your question. So you'll find that my answer is perhaps a bit perpendicular to your very well-targeted question, because as I was reflecting on your question, I realized that it wasn't that simple and I didn't have a really great answer. Um, but before I begin, I'd like to uh, make a short preface. The first is that uh, the last week I've been recovering from the flu, so I'm a little rough. Uh, so forgive me for that. And the second is that I just realized that um, Zoom is not allowing me to share my slides. That's fine. I'll happily share them with whoever's interested later, but it means that we're going to do this verbally. Um, and it might allow me to be a little more Spartan in my um, in my talk, which is not a bad thing. <clears throat> so the question was about um, how can we foster collaboration and create an environment of collaboration with the public sector? And for me, this is really about municipalities taking a stance and taking a position and setting their terms of engagement. Um, and originally, the last years, I've been thinking about AI as AI for urban services, very specifically. Um, and there we have things around procurement and how do we, because in-house capacity is never enough, how do we like build those working relationships? But with generative AI, it's at a very different scale. This is very often not so much you know, people walking into your office. It's like very often we're thinking about chat GPT and something um, at a different scale level. So as I started thinking about this, I wanna share one idea with you that has been kind of fermenting at the back of my mind and um, I'd like to throw it on the table. And that is that generative AI is primarily a leadership challenge, which I think makes a nice uh, segue after Damiano's last comment about cities and their innovation strategies. So what do I mean by this is that um, generative AI in the popular imagination is very new. It's been around for a while, um, but I mean, it really kind of exploded in late 2022 um, and early 2023. And I think that generative AI has changed our kind of collective understanding, our popular understanding of AI in three ways. The first is that AI is very mundane. It's something procedural. It's like the autocorrect, like the predictive text in your phone. It's something that my neighbor uses to write emails to his boss when he's bored at 3 p.m. Um, it becomes something much more insidious and something that's very accessible to everybody. <clears throat> and this is really important for cities because it seeps its way into bureaucracy and algorithmic bureaucracies really affect people's lives. The second way that I think that, Jenna, you know, let's say the process of last year has changed things is that um, it has shown us all of the challenges that have been raised around generative AI tend to be very structural. Things like copyright, things like open source, things like the use of water in uh, you know, areas that are already facing drought. These are structural challenges that require socioeconomic policy and decision-making to address. It's not something that, you know, one person in the tech or the innovation department in a city can address on their own. It's something that we need to, to work together towards. And I think this matters, especially for cities and city urban governance, because it reasserts the kind of regulatory leadership role that cities can, um, can play. The third thing is that this kind of change in the way that we talk about AI happened really fast. I mean, ChatGPT is um, the fastest growing app of all time. It had 1 million users within the first five days. I mean, Google Translate took, you know, several years, Netflix, whatever. Um, and this rapid, like the rapidity of rapidity, speed, the speed of this change um, and the way that it questions our sense of truth often, This the whole hallucination discussion, um, and how yet it's still part of our everyday. This is something very complex, which I just want to acknowledge. And what has been really interesting to see is, well, how do we respond? And I think for a lot of us who have been in the digital transformation space, who've maybe been a little bit nerdy about the digital transformation space, 
there's been lack of hope that like, oh, you, you know about AI, you must have all the answers. And we don't, um, but we have some pretty good suggestions. <laughs> um, and I think looking at organizational change has become really interesting. How do we respond to this complex disruption as an organization? Um, and this is where my focus on urban governance really comes in. I think we've seen over the last months, especially the rise of cities creating policies on how to use AI or generative AI or not. Um, really kind of taking awareness and creating boundaries on how to do that. We've also seen that there's significant gaps. Um, <clears throat> there was a recent um, survey done by uh, UN University and UN Habitat of um, AI in, in cities and responsible in AI in cities. And they found that the vast majority of cities worldwide, and we're not talking you know, New York and Tokyo, we're talking small and medium sized cities are actually relying on national level policies. And so there's a work of adaptation that needs to happen. Um, and there's also research um, recently been done by um, Linder and Open North, who I saw is in the room, which is quite nice. Um, showing that national and international frameworks are usually quite inadequate at the local level. In response to these kind of, or in part to some of these gaps, one of the things I see that's been very interesting, there's two things I'd like to share. The first is I see some people being, let's try, like Norway, they have a new, um, digital governance thing. They've recently put out a policy, but it was like a better approach. You know, let's try it out. Let's put it out there. Let's see what the response is. And then let's iterate and adapt. Um, it requires a particular social context. Norway is also a country, but it's a country of five and a half million people, which is smaller than a lot of cities. I've also seen um, increasing talk about people who are looking to adapt existing tools. Um, one of the ideas that I saw recently from Martha Galceran from Sidob was um, looking at how tools like AI registers, which we can discuss, but um, travel through knowledge sharing networks um, and how tools are looking to reuse and adapt, how, excuse me, how cities are looking to reuse and adapt tools um, in networks like EuroCities or urban AI, um, or how cities are looking to uh, adapt already existing procedures, which is an idea that I hear most strongly from Emily, which is really nice to be in the same panel together, but we can discuss that later. So to kind of round off, um, the way that I see cities trying, like dealing with the gaps, dealing with the, or responding to this enormous rapi rapidity, speed of change, excuse me, um, is that this is about change management. And um, change management becomes really interesting. And change management is about leadership. Leadership is social. We're talking about a socio-political change. And because right now, AI is really sexy. Everybody needs to be seen to be doing it. Everybody needs to be seen to have a policy about it that whoever is putting, or from the couple of people that I've spoken with, um, whoever's putting out a policy, other people want to be in on that. And that requires leadership to deal with those social relations in a particular context. So my like key takeaway for actionable insights going forward is that I think generative AI and what has happened in the last years is an opportunity for asserting urban leadership. And whenever, if anybody has funding and they're looking at capacity building, please invest in like people and our next generation of leadership. I will leave it there and I'll share the slides later. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> that was a super insightful and yeah actually inspiring um, answer. So thank you, Shazad. We're going to now move on to uh, Santiago. <laughs> uh, Santiago, um, my question for you is, in section three of the report, we reflect on some of the key capabilities that need to be cultivated in municipalities for the application of generative AI, such as problem engineering and a critical understanding of the technology and tools. Um, what are some of the key capabilities 
that municipalities need when working at the intersection of technology and public service, in your opinion. Furthermore, we know that Enterprise Bard has been adopted by the city of Boston. Which ways is it being used and, and how has it served as a productivity enhancer? Thank you. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be with, with all of you um, and to learn and, 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 and share. So I think that since we even started uh, talking in the creation of the report, a lot of things have changed. Um, just this past week, uh, OpenAI released its uh, agent technology, the GPTs, if you will. And I think that the trend is generally the barriers to access for individuals, these like fairly sophisticated technologies is reducing. And that's exciting, um, but it introduces some new challenges, I think. So again, generally, what particularly with generative AI, with these chat interfaces, what was radically different from a lot of AI in the past is the barrier for a normal person, whether they're an employee in middle management or even in the field or a constituent has gone down. And compared to someone having to learn about random forests and deep neural networks, you don't have to know these things to go and interact and get value. And, and I think that it presents kind of two challenges. One, we as government, we in the city of Boston have tried to start building a training programs for our employees to try to build exposure, but also know knowing that some of those investments need to be fairly agile because again, the technology keeps changing so quickly that whatever we're, we're mostly trying to train people to, to do the following. One, to understand that they are responsible for understanding what are the outcomes that you wanna get out of the tool. Um, I was in uh, the Smart Cities World Expo last week in Barcelona, and you know, sometimes we have conversations where, where the tendency tends to be, how is it that we're going to get AI to almost take over? Like, how is it that it's going to tell us what the right answer is? And instead, what we need to start building the muscle internally and like reaffirming the muscle internally within the, in, within the city is we are decision makers. Even the decision of how and when to pick up the trash translates into policy. It translates into other cascading effects. So these tools can help us get uh, efficiencies. It can help us change the way, as uh, Damiano shared, it can change the way in which government interacts with its constituents and level a little bit of the playing field where a, the access to data analysis and textual analysis goes down from, you know, like in the past, only the people in the policy office are talking about these things and now, or in the data analytics shop. And now people across the entire enterprise are able to, to have conversations of this caliber. So again, that's broadly, I think that we need to continue to build an environment of experimentation to continue to provide access to employees to learn how these tools work and to be able to develop these new ways of working that we've started to see around AI and human interacting together to try to uh, pursue objectives. Separately from that, I think that based on the nature of the, the technology, there's also important to start cultivating some technical expertise within the city to be able to understand one, what is the nature of risk of the tools? Um, how is it that we start evaluating the performance of the tools? And how is it that we start also evaluating the cost and the, the business adoption of the tools? Um, so far, in, with BARD and w w the way that we embarked in the city, we said, we know that people are active and that was a, a key motivator of for Boston to write the guidelines. Pe we knew that people were starting to access these tools because they're so widely available. And what we said is, we don't want people to feel like they have to be hiding to access even the free version of these tools. So in some sense, like the spirit of, of using BARD and using ChatGPT and using Claude and enabling people to, to play with different models was letting them experiment and to get a sense of, of what was possible, uh, starting to understand as well the risk of what were, 
you know, it's hard to describe what a hallucination is unless you've experienced a hallucination and you're like, that's not true. It looks like it's true, but it's not true. How can you start understanding the type of bias that, that exists in these uh, models? I said that something can be gendered or racist in a context, in an answer that is being provided by, by, by a large language model. Um, anyways, so just to synthesize again, I think broadly, the tools themselves are lowering the barrier of access to people, which is good. We need to create more flexible and adaptable training schemes, one that foster access with responsibility. We need to make sure that people that that it is clear to people that these tools are there to support human objectives and that they are understanding of those human ob objectives so that, so that they can evaluate the performance of the tools against those objectives. And then I think on the technical side, again, like the ability to uh, determine the performance of the models, the business model uh, side of things, the security uh, implications in a way that is responsible, that is that is not just like either driven by the by the vendors or just completely full out of fear and kind of uh, mythology. Thank you so much, Santiago. So many questions, but in the interest of time, <laughs> I'm going to continue. Um, and I think it's quite a nice segue into uh, the question that I have for Emily. Um, so thank you, Emily. <laughs> in section four of the report, we reflect on some of the risks and challenges in the adoption of generative AI for the public sector. Um, in your opinion, which are some of the largest risks and what protocols and safeguards can be put in, in place to reduce them. Um, furthermore, we know that technology is rarely politically neutral. Can you reflect on that particular challenge? Sorry to let my cat out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, everybody. I'm Emily Royal. Um, so I'm the Smart Cities Administrator for the city of San Antonio. Um, just to give a little bit of context, I, I basically manage our smart cities program and division within the Office of Innovation that reports to our city manager. I've been working in city government for about five years, um, and I've been in uh, public service in smart cities more or less for about 10 years. Um, so in terms of San Antonio, I just want to level set because I think the, the voice that I represent on this panel is that of a typical city, if you will, of a medium sized city. Uh, San Antonio is the seventh largest city in the United States. We have a population of about two and a half million. We are what you might call a majority minority community um, in the United States. We're a majority Latino city, and we're about uh, four hours drive from the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, we also have some of the highest rates um, of income and public health disparities um, compared to the national average for the United States. So I think that gives you a little context of, you know, the kind of conditions that I'm working in, um, applying emerging technologies um, and uh, new technologies like generative AI into public service. Um, my role and my team's role primarily is to consult with city departments and we help them adopt uh, emerging technologies and, and pilot them essentially. So I've had a really great opportunity in this role to kind of see the gambit of new technologies and how city departments are using them, but also the challenges um, and opportunities uh, around that use, how to procure, how to purchase these technologies, um, and you know what some of the stop gaps are into um, really transforming these technologies and integrating them into meaningful public service. So I myself am not an expert in AI, but that role really puts me at the front lines um, of helping cities, uh, city departments navigate artificial intelligence, at least in San Antonio. Um, in context, you know, I want to share what I am seeing our city departments do in a city like mine. Um, so they're using machine learning. Um, to do things like automatically sort applicants or recommend candidates um, for job opportunities or to allocate services, access to services like affordable housing vouchers, for example. Um, they're also using computer vision to do things like detect objects in the right of way um, and collect data about that. So analyzing the um, use of our intersections, 
um, being able to detect uh, an anomaly in uh, of the public right of way and sending a report to somebody who needs to address that anomaly. So computer vision has become very uh, powerful and useful in that context. Natural language processing, um, you know, to basically automatically capture and record customer feedback without necessarily involving a human. So that's the whole chatbot space, for example. And most recently, generative AI and looking at, you know, how we can engage residents with generative AI. I was really excited to see Damiano's, um, you know, presentation because I think that's really an interesting new direction to think about applying generative AI. But where I've seen it so far in the city is mostly around querying large databases of things like contracts. So looking at thousands of contracts, how can you query that database to get the information you need quickly um, and also even interpret a contract, which I think is really interesting and probably a little bit controversial when you think about the role that our lawyers play uh, within city government. And I'll tell you, you know, some cities invest very heavily in their legal teams. Our, the city of Dallas, I think, has a legal staff of like 400 people. Um, San Antonio has 60 legal staff. So I think we, you know, we have to consider these applications of generative AI and how they're really being used operationally in city government. Um, so we're looking uh, on the smart cities team is looking at generative AI in a couple ways, um, one around place based engagement for uh, bond construction, another one around um, improving our procurement process in partnership with our aviation department. But what I want to kind of share is that while generative AI is probably the latest iteration of you know, commercial AI that's available to cities, I think it's really important to highlight that very few cities are actually building these, these technologies in-house. Um, most cities don't have the capacity to do that. So what they're doing is buying this technology. Um, and I think that becomes a really core issue for uh, us to focus on in terms of policy and how we regulate um, the ingestion of AI technologies to provision you know, safe and ethical services. So there's a lot of challenges in this space, in the space of procurement. It is not sexy, <laughs> but it is very much a reality in terms of integrating these technologies um, into services in the long run. Um, and there are a ton of provisions to consider when we're thinking about how do we develop policy and procurement regulation of AI use in cities. Um, but I just kind of want to focus on like three of them. Um, the first one I think is super important is <laughs> like these AI tools need to be explainable and interpretable by city staff. We are the ones who own the relationship with our constituents, with our residents. And so we have a really high level of accountability to be able to explain why we're making the decisions that we're making, especially when those are assisted by algorithms. Now, if we're in a position of purchasing AI instead of building it ourselves, then we're relying really heavily on a, a private company to be able to help us do that. And what we're finding, I think, more and more is that a lot of those companies are not incentivized to share their data model with us. They consider it to be proprietary and they don't want to open the black box, right? Um, so I, I understand that dynamic, but I do believe that for a public sector client and a public sector use, the bar is just simply set higher. And I'll give you an example of that, um, you know, for the city of San Antonio, we uh, purchased a um, technology that used AI to basically grade the condition of our streets. Um, it We had sensors that we attached to city vehicles. They drove all over the city and they generated data about the quality of our streets. Um, the AI took all that data, it read it all, and it gave all of our streets a grade from A to F. A being this is a super high quality street, you definitely don't need to worry about investing in bond construction in this road. F being like, this needs attention immediately. You've got to spend taxpayer dollars on fixing this street. So we came up with that analysis and then we shared it to city council. And one of our council members uh, rightly observed that uh, we were recommending investments in some of our richest neighborhoods. So how does that make sense? How did we arrive at that conclusion? And unfortunately, because we didn't know how that data model worked, we couldn't answer the question. We're like, the algorithm told us so. 
which is like super unacceptable, right? It might be different if you say, well, the consultant told us so, and here's the consultant to explain, but it's really different when you say, well, we purchased a solution. We got an insight out of it, right? This was a couple of years ago. So that really kind of began to trigger San Antonio's interest in making sure that we don't run into those types of issues again by collaborating with other cities to build policies to respond to that. Um, the other point, the second of the three that I think is really important for cities that are trying to write policy in this space is this issue that's been brought up by other panelists about being non-discriminatory and unbiased. Um, that's really interesting to me because in the provision of city services, sometimes we want to be very distinctly biased against our marginalized groups or towards our marginalized groups and underserved communities. We actually want to prioritize them in some of the provisions of our services. So if I'm using AI that's been regulated to be unbiased in order to process um, access to SNAP benefits, for example, I definitely want that algorithm to be prioritizing certain people and groups. So how can I trust that the developer of that algorithm is building a data model that is going to be customized to my audience, be customized to my city's needs and reflect some of those necessary biases um, that we wanna incorporate in those decision-making tools. So that's an interesting thing that, you know, I'm, I'm all about the, the fairness and accountability of algorithms, but I do think in some cases, cities wanna be biased for very good reasons, right? Um, then the third one is accountability. I think about this a lot, um, you know, when we, uh, you know, use these tools in order to deliver services, if it makes a mistake, or if there is a problem, if we misallocated a service or we took a service away from somebody based on an AI tool, who's liable for that? Does that person get to hold the city accountable? Do we hold the vendor accountable? Or do we hold the developer of the actual algorithm accountable for that? And, you know, the stakes are not high most of the time, but I think over time, as we see these technologies grow and become more widely used and more acceptable, we're going to start running into these types of scenarios. Um, and that will probably end up with setting some legal precedent for uh, accountability in the use of these systems. Um, so those are my three major points. Um, and then in terms of, you know, to Ruth's question about um, how do we solve for this? <laughs> um, I think city governments have to collaborate with each other. Um, I'm pleased to share that San Antonio and I believe Boston as well and some other folks on the call have joined a coalition of cities. Uh, it's very new, but it, it's a group of cities that are really trying to streamline our policy approach. Um, and also just our, our questioning of vendors, what we ask of vendors at that moment of procurement so that we can really um, almost unionize, if you will, and say, as a group of major cities in the United States, we refuse to adopt AI technologies that fail to do certain things. Um, so I think that kind of collaborative effort is really important so that cities are stronger together um, as they interface with the private sector in this new and emerging frontier of technology. So those are my two cents. Thank you so much. I think this really, again, just highlighted the complexity uh, in the application of generative AI for urban governance, um, as well as many of the trade-offs, um, which just seem to be kind of innate. Um, so I think we'll now move on to the collective questions. <laughs> I'm just going to uh, ask a couple of questions, um, which any of the panelists, uh, you know, feel free to answer. And then we'll, of course, move on to uh, questions from the audience, because um, that's also very important to uh, hear what everyone else on the call wants to ask. So, I mean, we've already sort of touched on this, um, but my question is, what do you... What do you think are some of the differences in terms of maturity um, in the adoption in in the adoption uh, of uh, this technology between you know when ChatGPT was launched a year ago and today? What are some of the the changes that 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 we are seeing? And yeah, how 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 has uh, things how have things changed over the last the last year? Whether that's in industry or within government. I'd jump in and say 
there's a lot of things that I that I believe that were unexpected, um, and it validated kind of an approach that is a little bit more open. Um, the one that I would bring up is there's been, I think that having more concern around the application layer rather than just the fundamental models seems to be increasing in interest. Um, we at the city ended up banning the use of some of the new transcription tools that leverage generative AI to create summaries, but it's not necessarily because of the way that it created, you know, the summary enough itself and the LLMs, but because these technologies were adding themselves to meetings without um, a consent from the participants. And in fact, if you I subscribe to one of them, it invite themselves to every meeting, even if you had not attended. And it's one of these liminal spaces when in the legal side of things where we're like, are these transcriptions actually a form of recording? Are they subject to consent uh, from a wire, you know, like from a two party consent and wiretapping perspective, or are they just no the notes of, a, of one of the participants? So again, there's a lot of things that are unanticipated. And I think that how we use them is going to matter a lot. Not only how the, the how does the fundamental technology keep improving? Anyone else want to add to uh, Santiago's uh, thoughts? Yeah, I'll um, I'll add something. I live in Europe. I live in the Netherlands, um, and Europe is um, sold, marketed a little bit as a frontier for digital policy with the EU AI Act. And I think um, Gen AI has also, or the I keep wanting to say rapidity, I'm sorry, the speed of change of disruption of uh, Gen AI um, in the last year has also affected that process. Um, in, I mean, the the EU AI Act was supposed, is supposed to be signed by December 6th. Not sure if that's still gonna happen. There's a lot of discussion around whether the regulatory strength of hard law has actually been weakened. Um, the company of OpenAI has also done um, you know, tours for the politicking of shaping digital policy. And my feeling, um, which is very subjective, um, is that there's less blind reliance that the law will save us. Um, and that we're looking at how how can we shift guidelines into, you know, local level policy. So I, I don't know if that was a very um, clear answer, but I see that the um, the expected role of legislation um, is also shifting. Interesting. So you feel like the local levels become more sort of important now as to perhaps what it was is more of an emphasis. Yeah, I I may be biased because I care a lot and I work on cities. So cities <laughs> are really important. But yes, in the in the discussion, there is. Um, it has kind of really brought brought down to to scale. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, anyone else, or should I move to the next uh, question? Okay, I'll Here's move an on. Observation, maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go, go for it. Thank you. Oh yeah, no. Kind of uh, one thing that is kind of uh, I find at least particularly interesting for me is that is that now after one year of, of, of this mainstream technology, I mean, or this technology becoming mainstream, we start to finally see also counterculture movement. So we've seen now uh, last week the example of the Bandier, where like basically people from the peripheries of, of, of Paris started to uh, share photos uh, to Mid Journey saying that this is the real Bandier. That's not how it looks like in your biased kind of generative AI. So I think this is a very healthy thing to have is that, uh, you know, after the hype, now we start to have the counterculture. And I think this is going to help us actually uh, understand how to better bring this technology to the governance level. So behind the hype. Of, so I think this is something that perhaps we're seeing emerging and hopefully even more. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that example, but I think that's very interesting how local communities are trying to challenge <laughs> the outputs of these models. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question, uh, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Um, so, I mean, the next question really is on, um, do you have any practical, do any of you have any practical advice to municipalities 
uh, in the collaboration with different stakeholders uh, in implementing generative AI. Of course, I think, Emily, you've touched on this quite a bit already, um, and others did, but yeah, if we just maybe a couple of points, or even you, Damiano, from your uh, from an in industry perspective, um, that would be great couple of, of things. Yeah, um, I think that for cities that want to deploy generative AI and work with other stakeholders to do it, uh, a really like the center of the discussion has to be what is the problem we're trying to solve for? Um, because I think if you really have that understanding and that is a shared understanding with stakeholders, then the argument is so much stronger to justify the use of a particular tool. And it really shouldn't be about the technology for the technology's sake. It really should be towards addressing actual problems and lived experiences of the public that you serve. So at the end of the day, I feel like whether we're talking about digital twin or gen AI or IOT, like it should be in service of our community and it should be done in collaboration with our community. So, you know, to the Banlieu point, like, I, I think that's such a, a great example of, you know, what happens if you don't put residents first in the process of setting those use cases for these types of tools, because there are risks, right, involved in using them. Um, and then, you know, just procurement, like, I think this is a heavily overlooked issue. People are like, well, cities need more capacity and need leadership and need expertise. And it's just like, at the end of the day, like literally none of this actually happens if we can't buy these tools. Like, <laughs> And so we, we have to focus on finding ways and avenues to uh, either help cities build this stuff truly in-house um, or really find creative and new approaches to uh, working with the, the private sector community to do that effectively. That's like so, so important, um, you know, to bring cities into the 21st century of, of emerging tech. Yeah, I think that's really, really important and kind of reminds me of a, in the interview, I remember in Shazad, in our interview with you, you spoke about um, kind of principle driven technology adoption. Maybe you could just uh, yeah, expand on this a little bit um, to complement Emily's uh, answer. Sure. Um, I was going to say I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> so, but very much echoing what Emily said that it needs to be about why are we doing this in the first place? Um, and that if we just leave it open to let's build something, um, when you're looking at responsible AI or responsible, you know, technology development, it really has to start from the values. What do we care about? Um, and I think Emily's point about building a shared understanding, that's really the foundation for a successful and meaningful collaboration. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so now I think we can open up to the audience. Um, so if anyone has a question, um, I don't know if there are any questions in the chat already, but you also just feel free to put up your hand and open up your mic and ask it. Leandri, <laughs> go for it. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Ruth. And uh, thanks everyone for the amazing thought and insight. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. I learned a lot. But I have, like, it's almost a funny question. Like, uh, I don't know, uh, you guys here, there are a lot of people working for local government. Don't you feel like, um, I mean, I say local government officials or even us as a planner, we think a lot about AI as something like almost someone. Like, we, we put a lot of energy on working on AI, regulating analyzing the bias and we are almost focusing uh like forgetting why we are thinking about that i mean is it not like we are missing something here we spend a lot of energy on thinking of ai but is it really the problem is it really on what we should focus on i mean this is kind of question that i have i don't know if i formulate it well but it's almost like a feeling that i have <laughs> around this issue of ai and those kind of things thank you <clears throat> yeah, I I mean I I definitely agree with that. I I as a practitioner 
I mean, you guys would laugh at all of the different kinds of pitches I get from vendors for technologies on a regular basis. And, and I never advise to work with a company that isn't first asking me what is the problem. They always want to come with the tool, <laughs> with the solution, and it's technology that's looking for a problem. And I'm not in the business of creating problems for tech companies to solve. I'm in the business of serving my community. And so I asked them, what's the problem? Slap that into a roadmap, which is what we've done basically in San Antonio. Our smart cities roadmap is our public mandate for what the vision is of our community for technology and, and its role in public services. And so I do think we get a little bit lost sometimes this, and don't get me wrong. I think all of this is incredibly exciting and powerful, truly powerful. Um, I just want to ensure that for a city like San Antonio, where many of our residents are working two or three jobs, I want to be able to answer the question of how does AI help your life? <laughs> how does it help you? And that is going to be the key to the long-term use of these solutions by cities. Yeah, if you can add on that, actually, I, I really agree. And the kind of, uh, I think why many companies uh, um, sort of uh, do it that way is because if you would if you would actually work on a local problem, it would be quite difficult to then scale it up, right? Like, for instance, the kind of, uh, we started as urbanists, actually. That's where we, that is the difference, is that we're working with cities and ministries to, to understand what are the issues in their communities and then how to solve them. And that's why we started to model the AI. So we don't actually, we haven't used DALI or stable diffusion. We have our own gen AI models. And we started with the training of local models, actually. I read in 2018 uh, in Venice, Luca Stornoyolo, the developer was doing that. Um, but that's, that's the thing, like, uh, this is kind of our mission. It is to sort of empower communities. But what, what happens, of course, is that once we create a local model, let's say for, I don't know, Rome or Helsinki, that model stays there. We cannot scale it up to another city, right? So that's sort of why many companies, I think, uh, kind of uh, cannot, in some cases, localize their their technologies. But for us, it's more like the goal. Uh, and I think, indeed, the bias, I think, to answer also the question is that I think, uh, yeah, we're spending quite a bit of time to understand what is the bias in the AI. But indeed, like, my answer would rather be, why don't we just add the bias that we want to add to the AI? So which means training the model. You start with the base model, then you invite the citizens to bring on their photographs, to tag their photographs with their emotion. And then you can go from, you know, social emotions to an emotional AI, basically. So that's sort of the, exactly, instead of worrying about the bias, let's collectively bias the model, right? So let's, let's do that. That's sort of the, kind of, if I can answer your question. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Um for answering Leandri's question. Um, I, th I see, Todd, you have a question. Yeah, thanks. Um, Todd Escher with uh, Bloomberg Associates, which is part of the Bloomberg Philanthropy. Um, thanks to all of you for, for giving your insights. You know, we, Bloomberg Philanthropies just at City Lab, some of you may have been there, released um, a bunch of information, kind of a survey from mayors with Johns Hopkins University. I'm trying to take my hand out at the same time. And, um, looking at how cities are are looking to use AI, but that, that's the perspective of, of the mayor, the chief executive of the city. And I wondered for those of you who are actively working in cities right now, the not just governance, but where are you seeing the responsibility of AI? Where does it sit now? It seems like a lot of the IT um, leaders have, have kind of um, taken, taken the charge but because there's legal implications and policy implications um, interface with the public, um, where's the right place for it? And does it almost, are things moving so quickly that it just ends up putting those bodies in the role of policing usage? Um, how can you really deal with the fact that, you know, the tools are being integrated into systems that people can freely use on their own? I kind of liken it a little bit to sort of what happened with social media, you know, 10, 12 years ago, where uh, agencies could reach out and, and do their own things. And then the communications apparatus had to kind of come in and, and police the usage. 
but this feels like the scale is is far beyond and the speed as well. So I guess, where do you see um, cities who are really thinking um, thoughtfully about the, the use of AI? Where does the responsibility sit within government structure? If I can take a stab at it, I think, look, this type of technology, especially again, the the way in which, to Shasta's point, the, the ability of people to get a hold of the technology, not only within government, but outside in our communities, it's so, it's at a scale that's kind of unprecedented. And I think that it requires a little bit of a holistic approach. In Boston, you know, I am a member of the mayor's cabinet and I work very closely with everyone. I work closely with the chief of policy, with the uh, P chief, uh, chief people officer, with the CFO. And there's all sorts of considerations around this technology, the cost to the city, the impact in bargaining and ethical considerations. Yeah, like a lot of these technologies are particularly good at disrupting people in the creative industries. And we see through the protests from SAG and others, and we have to make policy decisions around how is it that we're going to protect creative people that tech that usually are very vulnerable. Um, they work in gigs and starts and they're economically very vulnerable, but they add a lot of vitality and a lot of importance. And Bloomberg funds a big portfolio of urban art, knowing you know like how important art is to our city. So I think that we need to have a very holistic approach to thinking about this. I, In the case of Boston, I think why in some sense, it's been natural, I guess, like for, for us to lead some of this stuff. I think when you start thinking about security, the type of data, um, the integration between this these technologies and other applications, I think that it is helpful for that to happen within the IT, the innovation and technology group. But I've had conversations with people that are in similar roles in other cities and the approach is much more defensive. And as we need to cut it out and blast it outside. And look, I've worked in technology in three cities for 10 years. If people are gonna do the wrong thing, they'll come up with very clever ways of doing the wrong thing. And the more that you push them to do the wrong thing, the more insecure that their behavior is gonna be. So it's been about risk mitigation, um, knowing when and how to build control systems. And for instance, when we made the the ban of the transcription services, the way that we were able to disable it, we have a hybrid workforce. So some people are accessing these tools outside in their homes. So what we ended up was disabling the way that uh, the, the mechanism by which those tools integrate with our Google environment with our so you have, I think that having that holistic view is what allows you to do good governance and and more holistic planning and understanding both the ethics, the the kind of within the organization and also uh, around in society. Um. So Todd, I'll, I'll just quickly build off of that as well. Um. I think what we've seen in San Antonio is is that. IT really wants to take on, at least for San Antonio, critical operations and enterprise. They are they don't really want to wade into frontier emerging tech spaces um, because they're just waiting to see how the market's going to play out, basically, and the city's not going to make a huge investment in capacity, staff, or resources until it's really mainstream. Um, and so there becomes kind of a need for a, an innovation team, or in our case, a smart cities team to carve out an incubation process where we basically bring in these technologies, we bring in city departments as clients, and we prototype and test them. And we're building use cases for the policy. We sit separately from IT, but IT has oversight in our governance. So like my chief information officer is plugged in every step of the way. And that way IT can kind of help guide us in terms of like, well, what should the security protocols be for this new thing? And, you know, they also get a taste for what's possible, which helps them determine what those long range investments really should be in, in the tool and, and where we're going to position ourselves in San Antonio um, to adapt. Right. So I think it, it there's a strong need Um to create that kind of prototype sandbox environment that's managed by a smart cities team outside of IT, but with IT governance. 
Thank you so much for those answers. Thank you so much for the question, Todd. Um, I think we're basically up with time. Um, so just want to say thank you so much to the panel again. Thank you to everyone who's attended. And I'm now going to hand over to Hubert, who I think is going to close for us. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Ruth. Sorry. Thanks a lot. Thanks again uh, to all of our experts, Emily, Santiago, Damiana, Shazad, uh, for sharing all your insights, uh, all your exper experience. Um, also, thanks again, actually, for reminding that behind all those walls, all those technologies, all those markets, uh, we have a kind, we need actually a kind of collective leadership. Uh, we have a kind of uh, collective um, responsibility and at the root, at the heart of all those technology, uh, we still have this mission that you that you all actually uh, recall, which is about serving community people and also make some uh, voices louder, people voices louder. So really, thanks a lot for reminding this kind of um, fundamental mission uh, that we, we don't have to forget when we are talking about technologies. Um, again, the report uh, is available, uh, freely available in Urban AI website. I just put the, the link in the in the chat. The recording will be uh, soon available on our YouTube channel. And maybe one last thing, uh, this is important to uh, to mention it, as Ruth said it in the beginning of this uh, uh, presentation, this is an exploratory project we are doing. So we are really in the beginning. This is the first steps of something much more ambitious. And I saw so many fascinating questions, comments, reactions in chat, in live. So if some of you want to reach out to be part of the next step of this uh, collective project research, please just let us know. Thanks again to all of you and see you soon online or in physical. <laughs>